each vertex of this, um, of this graph G, you retain with probability P independently, or you delete it with probability one minus P um, if you don't retain it. And in this way, you obtain a random subgraph, the induced graph in the set of retained vertices. I've even emphasized here that all of my graphs will be simple and connected in this talk. So uh, you get a subgraph of uh, your original graph. Of course, the subgraph is not going to be connected, but you consider its connected components. It might be connected, but you look at the connected components in any case. And um, I will be interested in the case that the graph G is infinite. And in this case, you may ask whether the subgraph GP is also infinite. And, uh, and uh, it turns out this is a monotone event that um, there is a threshold for this. There is a certain value PC. And if uh, your uh, percolation probability P is smaller than PC, then there is a zero chance to see an infinite cluster, an infinite connected component in GP. And it, if it is larger than PC, the chance is one. Um, Classically, this uh, object, this um, process percolation is studied on structured graphs like lattices, ZD, or the, when you do it on the complete graph, it's called the erdos rheny GNP model, as most of you know, or you may do it on regular trees. These are very structured graphs, but uh, talking about general graphs is also of great interest. And in this talk, I'd like to discuss uh, the site percolation process on infinite planar graphs. So the emphasis here is especially on being planar. So I'd like to know a bit more on what happens when you do this percolation process on planar graphs, and especially if I can say anything about the value of PC. In fact, not the precise value, but rather bounding it from zero and one, as you will see. Um, and let me just mention that this talk will use a site percolation. There is also a related process, bond percolation. In fact, that's what you get on the erdos rheny graph. Uh, in bond percolation, you, you keep every edge with probability P. But when I speak of planar graphs, it will be important that they talk about site percolation rather than bond percolation. So here is an illustration, just to get an idea. I took this from Wolfram Demonstrations Project. Um, here you see uh, part of the grid graph, z squared, the square graph, square lattice z squared. And uh, you see the, the percolation process on it at uh, three values of uh, p. The percolation threshold for the grid graph is roughly 0 0.59274. This value I took from, uh, sorry, from Derrida and Stauffer. Um, they, they, there are even better values known. And you see that as I increase P, more and more of the graph is uh, open, is, uh, is retained, and the, the connected component of the top and bottom is highlighted, and you see that you get something which is rather large connected components once P is, uh, approaches the threshold and goes beyond it. When you go beyond the threshold, there should be an infinite cluster in the infinite grid. Okay, what other planar graphs can you come up with? What can you think of? There is the uh, simple uh, Z, the integer graph. That's the easiest example. It's a planar graph. And of course, in that case, PC is one. You, um, if you just have all the vertices arranged in a line, and even one vertex is missing here and another there, then you get a finite connected component. So the threshold for percolation is one. Uh, if you look at the uh, grid graph, again, as I said, PC is 0 0.59. On the triangular lattice, it turns out that PC is exactly one half by duality, uh, roughly speaking. It's still a theorem to prove. And in fact, this will be an important value for me. One half is, uh, um, the talk is somehow around this value of one half. Um, there are other graphs, there are trees. Trees are also planar graphs. The binary tree has the threshold equal to one half. And if you take general trees, you can make the threshold as large or as small as you like. And then there are various um, more complicated examples. I've put in a Voronoi diagram. You can take a set of points in the plane and the Voronoi cells, meaning the set of um, the places in the plane which are closer to one point than to all other points that divides the plane into cells. And if you think of each cell as a vertex of your graph and the adjacent cells as the um, adjacent in your graph, you get an interesting planar graph and you may do percolation on that too and people have at least for random point processes. I've put in a picture of random triangulations. 
And the last picture, the picture of the loop ON model, this um, only for those who know what it is, but it's a random collection of loops. And this was actually a motivation for me in this work. Uh, you may think that two loops, these are fractalish loops formed in some funny way. And you may think that two loops are adjacent if they touch. And you may ask, what does this graph look like? And this was actually a motivation for this one. Okay, so um, the question that uh, I'd like to focus on is how high or low can the value of PC be for planar graphs? But immediately you get the easy answer that it can be as high or as low as you like. Uh, for instance, uh, there is a general bound on PC from below, maybe due to Hammersley from 1957. If the graph is of bounded degree, then uh, there is no infinite cluster when P is very small. For instance, if it has maximum degree seven, there will not be any infinite cluster if P is less than one sixth. Uh, this is an easy bound because you may bound the number of pads of length L on your graph. Uh, but this bound is sharp if you look at the regular tree. So if you look at the seven regular tree, PC is actually one sixth. In this way, you can make PC as small as you like. Um, and similarly, you can find planar graphs with PC as close to one as you like. So this answers the question of how high or low can it be. However, we'll now focus on more on subclasses of planar graphs and ask if we can say more there. And specifically, there, are, there is a, a lovely set of conjectures of Binyamini from 2018 that relate this question to the behavior of simple random walk on the planar graph. Let me uh, give a few definitions and then state Binyamini's conjectures. So we say that the graph, the planar graph in this case, is recurrent if the simple random walk on it returns to its starting point infinitely often, otherwise it is transient. Um, now here's a definition perhaps not everybody knows. G is called one-ended if when you remove any finite set of vertices, you leave just one infinite connected component. For example, the square grid is one-ended. You remove something and still there is one infinite component, but the integer lattice is two-ended. You remove a point, and it has two infinite connected components. So this is the definition of one-ended. A planar graph is called a triangulation if it has a drawing in the plane with all the faces being triangles. Binyamini, um, Binyamini focused on bounded degree one-ended triangulations. And um, right, uh, Agelos comments about almost surely being missing. I, I don't write almost surely in this talk. There was no room in the slides. But if I don't say, then it's almost surely. <laughs> so, um, Binyamini uh, focuses on bounded degree one-ended triangulations and then conjectures that if this triangulation is transient, then at one half, so I, I look at P equal one half, specifically one half, it will have an infinite cluster. And if it is a recurrent triangulation, then at one half, it will not have an infinite cluster. This last thing was a question, was not a conjecture. So it's very interesting. Uh, planar graphs can be, um, um, it can be in some sense very big, very small. The binary tree is somehow a very big graph. The square grid is a pretty small graph. And this fact of being big or small is captured by the random walk being transient or recurrent. That is one way to capture it. And Binyamini suggests that this also captures other properties of the graph, such as what does the percolation do at p equal one half. One half is a very special value for triangulations, for planar triangulations. Um, so uh, according to the conjectures, this determines the, um, the transients recurrence determine the existence of an infinite cluster at one half. Uh, however, Binyamini also points out in his, uh, in his paper that this is open even if you give me another value of P. So for instance, if the graph is transient, it should have an infinite cluster at one half. Can you tell it at least has an infinite cluster at 0.9 or at 0.99, is there a fixed value of P such that it always has an infinite cluster at that P, not depending on the graph? If it depends on the graph, then yes, there will be a PC for the graph, but the fixed value good for all graphs simultaneously. And this also was open, but in fact, this is the, the main result. So I do not resolve the means conjecture, but I get a partial progress towards it. And this is in the next slide. Um, 
so I show that there exists a uh, P0, P0, which does not depend on the planar triangulation that I speak of, um, such that for all one-ended triangulations, if it is a recurrent triangulation, then there is no infinite cluster at P0. P0 is a small value. You may think about e to the minus 26. Um, whereas if the graph is uh, of bounded degree and transient, then it does have an infinite cluster at 1 minus P0. So again, it does not resolve uh, Benjamin's conjecture, but um, it gives an analog of them if you replace one half by a sufficiently small or sufficiently high probability according to the case. And the emphasis is that the value of P0 does not depend on the triangulation, and this was unknown before. So it was unknown that the infimum of PC over all recurrent planar triangulations, one-ended, is bounded from zero. It cannot be arbitrarily low, for instance. Uh, and in the recurrent case, the last comment says that in the recurrent case, I do not require the graph to have bounded degrees. Um, but this is a small point. So this is the result that I would like to tell you about. And uh, again, I was motivated by the study of a particular planar graph, in fact. So uh, this uh, funny graph over here in the, in the bottom left, the, uh, the loop point. But it doesn't, uh, the motivation is not the main point here. The point is that there are quite a lot of infinite planar graphs. And uh, it's interesting that you can say something about PC for such a large class. Uh, one-ended triangulations, but I'll talk about these restrictions of one-ended and triangulation at the end. So uh, in the rest of the talk, I'd like to tell you how you prove this theorem. And in fact, the proof is not very difficult, as you will see. It's, it's relatively easy, in fact, as you will see. But still, it's uh, perhaps, um, I think it's an interesting result. Okay, so uh, the main tool is what is called a uh, circle packing. So, uh, let me explain what that is. Uh, a circle packing is just a collection of disks in the plane with disjoint interiors. You can take any collection of disks in the plane in this, with disjoint interiors. They don't have to fill the plane. They don't have to, um, they don't have to form a connected graph. They don't have to do anything. Um, they may even have accumulation points. They might have radii going to zero very quickly so that there is a point such that they accumulate towards it. This is allowed in a circle packing. A very general thing. And uh, given a circle packing, you have a graph structure. Uh, two circles, two disks, in fact, are adjacent if they are tangent. And the accumulation points are already discussed. Uh, you may do site percolation on this graph, each disk you retain with probability p, you discard with probability 1 minus p, and you look at the remaining disks, and they still uh, look at the tangency structure and, uh, and look at connected components with this tangency structure. Um, one definition here, uh, the carrier. When you have a circle packing which represents a triangulation, then these little, um, the, the union of the disks and the little spaces between three adjacent disks. When you take three adjacent disks, there is a little space inside. This is called the, the interstitch of the, this triangle. The union of that is called the carrier of the triangulation of the circle packing. Um, and below you may see uh, two examples. One is, the, is in fact a circle packing representing the triangular lattice and the carrier of it is all of R squared. And another example has the carrier being the unit disk. Uh, and in the example where the carrier is the unit disk, all of the boundary of the disk is accumulation points of the circles. Uh, and the circle packings are very useful and the, it's well known. Um, right, and the, some, Robin was asking about uh, the carrier in the uh, case when you don't have a triangulation. Let's not define it when it's not a triangulation. It's not important for us. So when you have a triangulation, I think it's clear. Um, and the circle packings have been used uh, in, um, in many studies of planar graphs, especially because of the following theorem going back to Kebbe from 1936 and uh, reproved and emphasized by uh, others and Rev, Thurston and others, uh, that every planar graph may be represented by circle packing, even infinite planar graphs. Uh, but you may ask, uh, can it be represented by many circle packings? Can I do anything I want? Can I put the circles in a domain, for instance, of my choosing? And it turns out that there are restrictions when your planar graph is a triangulation. And this is given by the following theorem of Henschram, which is also going to be used in what I will talk about. 
Um, the theorem of Hezenschram, which is an analog of the uniformization theorems from complex analysis, there is a relation of circle packing and complex analysis that I will not discuss, but it was part of the motivation for Thurston, for instance. Um, but uh, the theorem of Hezenschram says the following. Uh, yeah, I should have uh, itemized the uh, things. Okay. Um, when you look at the one-ended triangulations, um, every such triangulation can be represented by circle packing that is carried by the entire plane or by the unit disk, but it cannot be represented by both. So it's either this or that. Uh, so every, every one-ended triangulation is either somehow a flat surface or it is like the hyperbolic disk. If you recall what I said earlier, every one-ended triangulation is either big, big meaning it's like the binary tree in some sense, it's like the hyperbolic plane, so it's carried by the unit disk, or it's small. What does small mean? So it's carried by R squared. So there's a dichotomy, a dichotomy about one-ended triangulations, big or small. And in fact, Han Schramm proved that this dichotomy is decided by the recurrence properties of the graph recurrent one in the triangulations are packed in the, uh, in the plane, whereas the transient, at least when they're bounded degree, transient bounded degree one in the triangulations are packed in the unit disk. This decides the dichotomy, so um, you can tell if the one in the triangulation is big or small by looking at the recurrence properties. And this is an important theorem, a milestone in the theory. There were, I think, partial results before. Okay, so um, how does this help me? Uh, I remind you that my goal is to discuss the uh, percolation on the um, percolation on one-ended triangulations. So I'm going to circle pack them. That just doesn't do anything, right? If I take a graph and I pass to its circle packing representation, then doing the side percolation on the original drawing of the graph the, or the original abstract graph, or on these uh, circle packing, that's the same, it doesn't matter, it's just another drawing. So I may as well do the percolation on this funny circle packing graph. And it turns out that there I can prove uh, the result. And, and the Leonardo was asking whether unbounded transient is open, not necessarily, it depends on how it is transient, I think. So unbounded transient could be, something is, uh, is true, but I forget which direction. Yeah, Asaf is answering that. And uh, okay. All right, so, uh, so here is in fact the main result. What I will talk about is site percolation on circle packings. This is what I would like to tell you about. And uh, the following is the main result. You take any circle packing. It can be anything. It doesn't need to be even connected. It doesn't need to have infinitely many uh, disks. It doesn't need to do anything but it will only be interesting if it's connected and has infinitely many disks. And you uh, do this side percolation on it at a small parameter P0. P0, you should think again, e to the minus 26. So a small parameter P0, and you retain uh, some of the circles. It turns out that at this small parameter, you cannot say that there is no infinite cluster. This, this will not be true. I cannot say that at P0, there is no infinite connected component because we know that there are planar graphs which have infinite connected components at arbitrarily low values of p. For instance, they take a, a seven regular tree, it will percolate at one six. They take an e to the 26 regular tree, will percolate at e to the minus 26 roughly. So, um, and, and these planar graphs have a circle packing representation. So definitely it's not true that uh, there is no infinite cluster at p naught. But what turns out to be true, and this, uh, this was not uh, conjectured before, so it was, um, this is the nice new idea here, one of them, that there is no infinite cluster that is of infinite diameter in this circle packing representation. So you cannot have a, a path of, of retained circles that goes to infinity. What, what you still can have is a path of retained circles that goes to an accumulation point. So, so if I go to the previous slide, for instance, you see on the right-hand picture that there are accumulation points. The, the theorem does not rule out that the retained infinite cluster goes to one of these accumulation points, to the boundary of the disk, but it does rule out going to an Euclidean infinity, okay? This is the, the emphasis here. 
this is the first clause of the theorem. There is no infinite cluster of infinite diameter. But um, there is also a second clause that is more quantitative. If all the circles, all the disks have bounded diameters, then uh, the probability that a disk is connected to distance r decays exponentially, exponentially like e to the minus r divided by the maximal diameter. If all the disks have diameter seven, then uh, you, it's hard to go to distance r like e to the minus one seventh r. So this is a more quantitative version of the result. Um, and the, in the middle, you see a picture, the CD-ROM. Uh, this is supposed to illustrate the event that the disk C0 in the center is connected by a path of retained disks to distance r. I hope the picture is sufficiently clear. We'll see several of these pictures uh, later on. Uh, it should have been capital D in the diameter of diameter less than or equal to D. Um, uh, so uh, Jacopo asked, okay, this I don't know how about to actually do an algorithm for circle packings I don't know much about, but there are algorithms for them. So I'm not explaining this one. I just say it exists. I have a circle pack. All right, and there are a few, a few uh, remarks on the main result. So as I said, uh, there could be infinite clusters going to accumulation points. But of course, if you don't have accumulation points, if your circle packing has no accumulation points, then there, then there isn't any infinite cluster at P0 because any such cluster would have to go to infinity. Uh, but then this connects me back to the theorem of hen schramm because hen schramm were saying that if you have a one-ended triangulation which is recurrent, then it's, uh, it's circle packed in the plane without accumulation points. The fact that the carrier is R squared means that there are no accumulation points. So if so it means that any such recurrent one-ended triangulation will not have an infinite cluster at P0 because it will not have a cluster going to infinity, but those are the only infinite clusters because there are no accumulation points. So this means that this theorem, the main result, combined with the Hesh-Ram theorem, implies the, uh, the, the result that was stated before, that if G is recurrent, then at P0 it has no infinite cluster. This, uh, this will prove that. Uh, you, you may ask, what about the transient case? So uh, here it's written that the transient case uh, that was stated before, that, at, that it does have an infinite cluster at 1 minus P0, it doesn't uh, follow immediately from the hash ram theorem or from this, but it follows with one additional argument that I will not present, uh, the fact that you have duality. When you have triangulations, how can there not be an infinite cluster? The only way that there isn't an infinite cluster or, or just a connection, if you will, is if there is a blocking, a blocking cycle of, of non-retained vertices. When you have triangulations, there is duality like that. Either you have a connection of retained vertices or you have a connection of non-retained vertices. This is duality for triangulations. And if you are doing the percolation with parameter one minus P naught, like in the second clause of the theorem, then it means that the non-retained vertices are like percolation with parameter P0. So you may apply the, the quantitative part of the theorem and the hash ram theorem and, and you finish. And I don't want to explain all the details of that. So what I'm saying is that if you use this second clause of the theorem, the, the quantitative exponential decay with the hash ram theorem, you also get the transient case. And, uh, and lastly, uh, there is a conjecture here that in fact, in this theorem, you may take P naught to be one half, not, not in the quantitative part. I mean only the first part about the infinite clusters to infinity. Uh, if that is true, then that would be sharp because the triangular lattice has, uh, has PC equal to one half. And, uh, and that you can think of the circle packing of the triangular lattice, it fills the plane. So certainly for any P larger than a half, the triangular lattice does have an infinite cluster to infinity. The theorem says that that's in some sense the worst that could happen. At one half, there shouldn't be any circle packing, the conjecture, not the theorem, shouldn't be any circle packing that has a connection to infinity. That would be a very nice theorem to prove. And uh, unfortunately, I haven't proved it, but I am interested to do so. Uh, and I think that would be a very nice goal. 
Uh, much of this stock is conjectures, actually. The proof is not that hard. Um, okay, so, um, so this is all about the main result. And the next slides will be the proof of the main result, the proof about the circle packing uh, percolation result. Are there questions you want to ask before I move on to the proof? Okay, so I move on and I tell you how you prove it. Okay, proof. So there will be six uh, proof slides. So first off, I'm gonna work not with circle packings, but with square packings. Uh, it's technically convenient. So you see, I'm gonna draw squares. Uh, not uh, circles. I should, did I write squares in the previous? Uh, it's not circles, it's, um, it's squares now. And it's really the same. If you have a square, th there is a corresponding Hashram theorem, but really also the proof that I present works both for squares and for circles. It's just easier, slightly technically easier to write it for squares. So that's why I present it this way, to present the easiest thing. So uh, you have uh, a packing of squares with disjoint interiors. Two squares are adjacent if they intersect, even if they intersect in corners. So then it doesn't form a planar graph if four of them intersect in corners. But it doesn't, even planarity doesn't matter, actually. Um, so, um, so you have a packing of squares, and you do percolation on that. You keep each one with probability p. And uh, I've defined here an event, the event that uh, s naught is, uh, is connected to distance r without using uh, the squares whose diameters exceed d, okay, after the percolation. So I, I only look at the, the large, the, the small squares, sorry. Can I uh, connect to distance r with the small squares? This is the event, s not um, arrow r less than or equal d. It's important to remember this event because I'm gonna use it in all the next uh, slides. Um, okay, and what do I want to prove? Uh, I want to prove the following result, which is not exactly the stated result from the previous slide, but it's very similar and you can go from one to the other. I just want to do the easiest thing that they can do. Um, I'm going to take such a square packing and I'm going to assume that all its diameters, the diameters of squares are at least one. So I don't want accumulation, but I don't want small diameters. But again, you can later enhance this. I just want to present something the simplest I can. And then I'm going to ask that the chance that a given square connects the distance r with squares of diameter at most 2 to the k is, has this exponential decay that I wanted to prove, e to the minus r over 2 to the k. Um, so I, as you see, I've discretized the diameters. I'm going um, to, instead of saying that all the diameters are are bounded by capital D, I'm saying that I only retain, I only take those which are bounded by two to the K and I, and I do it in the discrete scale. Okay, so um, what's written below is what I want to prove. The probability that you connect to distance R with, it mo with diameters at most two to the K is at most E to the minus R over two to the K. Um, yes, Julia asked if a square packing exists for a triangulation. Yes, they, they behave really the same as circle packings, but, but it's not important because the proof itself can be translated to the circle packing case. Okay, so, um, all right, so I move on. And now let us recall again what we want. We have a square packing squares of diameter at least one. We want to prove this bound. I'm going to do it by induction. Induction on what? A double induction on k, the maximum diameter of the squares I'm allowed to use, and r, the distance that I want to get to. A double induction. And, and there are some easy base cases that I'd like to get rid of right away. Um, if I, I can only use squares whose diameters are at most one, but also the diameters are at least one, then that means I can only use squares which have diameter exactly one, then the graph of squares that have diameter at exactly one has bounded degree. Uh, the degree of it is at most eight, you can see on the right, because I told you you can even pass through corners like that. So at most eight, and then if it has bounded degree, then the usual argument says that if p is smaller than one eight e to the minus one, then it decays exponentially. I, I put e to the minus one because I care about the constant, okay? Um, because there aren't, just aren't many paths in this graph. Um, 
So this gets rid of the base case uh, k equals zero, and I may assume it's the induction hypothesis that I, my k is at least one, and I've done it for k minus one and all r. This is the easy base case. Another easy base case, um, if r is very small, r is smaller than twice two to the k, then it's also unlikely to connect to distance r. Why is that? Because the initial square S0 itself needs to be open, and that already has probability P. So certainly the chance that S0 is connected to distance R is at most P, because the initial S0 has to be open, has to be retained. And if I take P to be smaller than E to the minus two, then this settles the case when R is not too large. Okay, just by taking p sufficiently small, I told you I will take e to the uh, I take p to be e to the minus twenty six. Okay, so the second induction hypothesis is that I've done it for small r. So now I and then I'm going to fix r greater than two to the k plus one and assume the result up to r minus two to the k up to a little bit less than r. Kind of by induction, I each time get a little further. Okay, so these were the induction bases, the two induction hypotheses. There is one other trivial case to get out of the way, and then I'll get into the heart of the proof. The next easy case is, is not quite a case. The next uh, easy point to discuss is given in this slide, proof number three. In order to use the induction, um, I have to say something about S0. S Re remember what is the uh, event that I'm considering. It's illustrated in this slide. The event is that S0 is connected to distance R, with diameter at most two to the k. If S naught has itself diameter larger than two to the k, well, then it's, then I don't, I cannot use it. And then of course it will not be connected. So if it has diameter larger than two to the k, I'm done. If it has diameter smaller than two to the k, it's good, but I cannot use the induction or not completely because one of the things I know in the induction is the statement for k minus one. So the best for me would be if S0 has diameter at most two to the k minus one, not two to the k, because if it's less than two to the k minus one, I can hope to build on the induction. Because as you can see in the induction hypothesis number one, I'm assuming the result is known for k minus one. So if I'm only gonna use squares of diameter two to the k minus one, I'm in good shape. So this is the next thing I want to get rid of. I'm gonna assume that the diameter of S0 is at most two to the k minus one. Indeed, if it is not, it is at most two to the k, but if it is not at most two to the k minus one, I cut it into four and I replace my square packing by another square packing in which S naught is replaced by one of these four guys. And, and I prove the slightly stronger bound that the chance to connect is not, is not only bounded by e to the r minus r over two to the k, but even one quarter that, so I can union bound over which of the little squares was connected to distance r. And if none of them was, then I can also say that the original one wasn't. So this is a simple coupling. I, this, this step I just don't want to say more about. Maybe not everyone understood it, but there is something relatively trivial going on here. And the upshot of it, the conclusion is that I may assume that the diameter of S0 is at most two to the k minus one. So let's recap uh, where we stand. We have a square packing with squares of diameter at least one with fixed k. We are assuming that the diameter of S0 is at most two to the k minus one. And we'd like to prove that the chance that S0 connects to distance r with diameters at most two to the k is at most one quarter e to the minus r over two to the k. This is what we want. This is in the first three lines of the slide. We also have certain induction hypotheses that will help us. We're assuming that we already know this if you replace k by k minus one, and then you can take all r, or if you keep k, but you make r a little bit smaller as r minus two to the k. So in this case, we assume we know it. Now, what do we do? We're gonna use this picture. This is the, uh, almost the end of the proof. <laughs> so uh, you want to get to distance r, and use diameters at most two to the k. What can happen? Well, either you get to distance r and you use squares of diameter at most two to the k minus one. And that's great because you know that's, that's unlikely by the induction hypothesis. So this is the first picture, the, the green, the green uh, path. The green path is symbolizing that the uh, 
all the diameters of squares that are used are at most two to the k minus one. This allows me to use the induction. This is great. If not, then maybe you have a connection to distance r, but you do use somebody of uh, diameter two to the more than two to the k minus one. But then there is the first guy that you use. So that means there exists somebody, there exists a square whose diameter is between two to the k minus one and two to the k, such that you go up to it using only diameters two to the k minus one, but starting from it, you start to use diameters at most two to the k. Is it clear there is the first guy which is large that you use, up to it you only use small squares, and, and afterwards you can use the big squares. And those are the only two cases that can happen, either this or that. So uh, the event that we want to bound is the union. And uh, as I was saying earlier, if you're in the situation of the first picture, the green pass, then the probability is bounded by the induction step. Probability is at most e to the minus r over two to the k minus one. So the main issue is the second, the second picture. So what can we say in the second picture? Let's see what is the event of the second picture. The event is, as I said, that there exists a square S. It is, mod it is big. It has diameter between two to the K minus one and two to the K. And then S naught connects to a neighbor of it using diameters at most two to the K minus one. And then continues from it using diameters at most two to the K. And, and the connection to the neighbor and the, and the continuing connections are disjoint because I took S was the first, the first square along my path to distance R. So the, the blue connection and the orange connection uh, are disjoint, cyan connection. Okay, and then this allows me to, get, to write a probabilistic bound on, this, uh, pro on the probability of this event. Because I have disjoint connections, I may employ the so-called Vandenberg-Kesten or BK inequality. It's also uh, intuitive, so I hope people who don't know it uh, are following. The chance that they have a blue connection followed by an orange connection and they are disjoint is at most the product of these chances. The probability of the blue times the probability of the orange. And what is the blue? The blue connection means that they have to go from S naught to a neighbor of S using the diameters at most two to the K minus one. This is the, the, first, the first expression here. I don't know if people can see my mouse uh, when I write, when I move it. You can? Okay, perfect. So, uh, so th th this first guy is the um, probability that S not connects to a neighbor of S. Because it's a neighbor, I've subtracted the term two to the K minus one because the neighbor has some diameter. Um, okay. And, and this is the, the second part is the probability that S connects to distance R from S naught because it has to go as, as a shorter path. I can subtract the distance of S naught from S. Okay, so this is what it is. And then the point is that to both of these terms, I can apply the induction because the first term has squares of uh, magnitude at most, diameter at most two to the K minus one. So I have the induction hypothesis number one to cover it. And the second case goes to a distance which is much smaller instead of R, it's at most r minus two to the k. So I have the induction hypothesis number two to apply to it. So in both cases, I know that these probabilities decay exponentially. So what is the resulting bound? It's written here. There are two, I've written it as cases because I have to separate into two possibilities. Let's only focus on the first case for now. In the first case, I have this exponential bound for the first term. And you see it is just e to the minus r on top here. This is r. I've copied r from the probability. Okay, d, d to the s zero minus s s naught comma s minus two to the k minus one is the distance that I want to go, and it's divided by the maximal diameter. So it's divided by two to the k minus one. This is just the estimate from the induction hypothesis number one on the first probability, and and this second one is the estimate from the induction hypothesis number two on the, uh, on, the, on the second probability. And again, I've just copied the distance you have to go divided by the maximal diameter. It's just exactly the uh, induction. And I, I take the product of these two terms and I get the resulting bound, e to the minus r over two to the k is what I want to get eventually. And it's, it's even better than that 
besides the factor e squared, there is a, a factor that helps me, e to the minus the distance of s naught from s. So if s, if s is very far away, meaning that they went a long distance using only squares of small diameters, this helps me, okay? So this first result that I've obtained is good if s is far from s naught. But, but you may ask, what happens if s is very close to s naught? And this could be a problem, in fact. If s is very close to s naught, maybe s is a neighbor of s naught, it could happen. Then this bound that they have on the, the first bound is a bit wasteful, actually, because they have the, the factor e squared there, and it's, it could be important. I want to get one quarter eventually, it's, it's bothering me. So for that case, for the case that s is very close to s naught, I'm gonna use a different bound. Um, again, I have two terms, the, the first probability and the second probability. The first probability, I'm gonna bound by a trivial bound. What is the trivial bound? If s naught has to be connected to a long distance, then in particular, it has to be open. So a trivial bound for it is p. Just open s naught, just retain it, just keep s naught. So this is why I put p as the bound here. And the second is just the induction hypothesis applied to the second probability, the same term that they had in the first estimate as well. So altogether, I get p times an exponential factor. And if I write it uh, in, this, in this way, I have e to the minus, the, the term that I want, e to the minus r over 2 to the k, multiplied by a term that could be large if s is far from s naught, but I'm, I will think about s close to s naught now, times p. And p I can make as small as I want because this is the point, to, to choose p small, like e to the minus 26. Okay, um, this was the main calculation of the proof. I don't know if everybody got it, uh, but I'll move on to the next slide and that will be the end of the proof. And if somebody wants to go back, we can do that. So I have these two bounds. And now I look at, the, I'm at the end of the proof. Um, and I see what, what did I get? I got that the probability that S naught connects to distance R is at most the sum of two terms. The sum because I had a union, a union of the green and the, the cyan and orange. Th this is coming from the green, e to the minus R. So this is coming from using diameters at most two to the K minus one. A minimum, a minimum comes out of uh, this, uh, this cases environment that they had, that they had two possible estimates. So I have a minimum. And all that times e to the minus r over two to the k that they want. Let, let's again see what, what did they get and a, and a big sum. So again, let's go back to the previous slide. This even, sorry. Um, so in the previous slides, I, um, I've written my event as the union. The first term got me this uh, e to the minus r over two to the k minus one. The second term I've estimated by saying that there exists S. Because there exists S, I will have to do a sum over all S. Okay, so, and, and then this was the estimate. So that's how I got this estimate. The, the first, the green connection, the sum over S and the minimum. And uh, what is S summed over? All the uh, squares that have a large diameter, diameter between two to the K minus one and two to the K. And lastly, I wanna say that there aren't that many of them. And this is where it becomes important that this is a square packing and say not a rectangle packing. Um, because when I look in a big square and I ask how many small squares are in it, by area considerations, there can't be too many because a square takes up a lot of space and, and, and they have to be disjoint. So there just isn't room for many of them. So if I ask specifically how many squares S of diameter at least two to the k minus one, there are at distance at most m two to the k from s naught, s naught also has diameter at most two to the k minus one, then by, um, by area considerations, the number is at most m squared. You may easily convince, order, order, I'm sorry, constant m squared. You may easily convince yourself of that. So this sum, if I restrict it only to those s's which are not very far, then it's a small sum. And so this sum I can replace by m squared for those s's which are distance m two to the k, but I also get the exponential factor e to the minus m 
that will help me. So the m squared fights the exponential factor and, and this sum becomes small. So I leave it to you to think of this last little step, but, uh, but this is all of it. So I've finished the proof because by choosing p sufficiently small, I can ignore uh, all the s's which are close. The s's which are far don't contribute much because of this exponential factor. So altogether, this whole sum is not too big. And this first term is also not too big because I've assumed r is at least two to the k plus one. Altogether, I can make the whole parenthetical expression less than one quarter and I've finished the induction. So this, uh, this ends the proof. I hope you could follow. And, uh, and there is a remark here at the end that these area considerations are the place where I use that these are squares and not say rectangles. Um, beyond the proof, I wanted to tell you a bit about extensions and conjectures. Are there questions about the proof that you'd like to ask now? Okay. Um, no questions at the moment, maybe at the end. So I move away from the proof and I'd like to tell you about more results and more conjectures. Um, more results, uh, I wrote theorem in progress. I think it's true. I, I plan to put it in a uh, revised version of my paper, but I didn't do it yet. Um, so did we actually use that we are in a planar setting? The important thing about planar graphs was that we had a circle packing representation. But if you already start from the circle packing, then you can forget about planarity. As we said, the square packing, for instance, is not even planar because squares, if you have four of them touching at the corner, it's not a planar graph. Indeed, this is not really about planar graphs. And there is a theorem here that generalizes what we did. Uh, you may think of uh, not even a packing, but just arbitrary sets in a metric space where two sets are adjacent if they overlap, if there is an intersection. And they could overlap quite significantly. They're not a packing at all. But you make the following assumption, the number of sets S, which are distance at most rho from a point and have diameter at most T, is at most uh, this expression exponential in the radius, and, but divided by the diameter. And if you have that, then I think the uh, side percolation also will not have an infinite diameter um, connected component if you take the probability small depending only on the two constants c1 and c2. This generalizes the packing case because when they're, pack when they're packing in rd or even in a, uh, a volume doubling, uh, um, in a doubling metric space, then, then this bound will hold. Okay, that's one extension. Another extension, I told you I was interested in the setup of the loop one model. This was one of my motivations. And, uh, and for that setup, actually, we are not talking about recurrent planar graphs. What we have is the so-called Benjamini schramm limit of planar graphs. I, I'm not gonna go into that. Most of you maybe don't know what it is or are not so interested. So I just mentioned very briefly that the theorem also says that for any Benjamini schramm limit of uh, finite planar graphs, there is no percolation at the same p naught that was uh, given in the, uh, in the previous theorem. And, uh, and here, the, uh, one of the important things to know is that any such Benjamini schramm limit has a circle packing in the plane with at most one accumulation point. And after that, it follows. And in this, I was helped greatly by Yasaf Nachmias, who mentioned to me that this uh, should be true and even told me how to show it because it's an extension of uh, something that Benjamin and Schramm did in 2001. Okay, so, um, so there is extension to Benjamin and Schramm limit. And lastly, there is something in progress that I'm thinking of. I, I think I, I, I hope I know how to do it, but I'm not fully sure. I didn't do the, all the details. I don't know for sure. Uh, we, if you recall the original result, what did we prove? We looked at one-ended, uh, triangulations, and we saw that they don't percolate at p naught. They don't have an infinite cluster at p naught. Why is it important to look at one-ended triangulations, uh, recurrent, recurrent triangulations? Could we just look at recurrent planar graphs and forget about one-ended and triangulations? And, and it may be the case that we can. So uh, this is what the last point is about. I think, at least in the bounded degree setting, I think it's true that if you have a recurrent planar graph of bounded degree at least, then you don't, then it doesn't percolate at P naught. 
So and in fact, shouldn't percolate at one half. Any recurrent planar graph, the idea is that the triangulation is edge maximal. So if you add edges to it, then it's, uh, it helps the percolation, but, but it might not stay recurrent. So you have to work a little. And then the, instead of the Hesch-Ram theorem, if you're not in the one-ended situation, there is a result of Gorel, Gurevich, Nafnes, and Chuteau that tells you about circle packings of non-one-ended graphs. I think it can be done, I'm not quite sure. The transient case does require triangulations because you use the duality argument. Otherwise, it's not true for transient case, but one-ended maybe can be removed. Okay, this is about extensions. Lastly, I talked to you about conjectures. I've already told you the main conjecture. I, I think this is really something very nice to prove Binyamini's conjecture or possibly to prove what I said about circle packings. So I think that if you take any circle packing, then at p equal one half, there is no cluster of infinite diameter. If you prove that, we, I prove that p not. If you can prove it happens at p equal one half, <clears throat> then you uh, obtain a positive answer to Binyamini's question on recurrent one-ended triangulations using the Hesch-Ram theorem, as I explained. This is conjecture one. Conjecture two regards the exponential decay. Uh, as we discussed at P0, which is kind of subcritical, it's much less than PC. PC maybe is more than one half. So at P0, we saw an exponential decay. The chance that a circle, a disk, connects to distance R decays exponentially in R. Is that in fact true for any P less than one half with a rate of exponential decay that doesn't depend on the circle packing? So what's written here is that there is a certain rate of exponential decay, f of p, so that for all the circle packings with diameter at most d, the chance that a circle, a disk, is connected to distance r decays with this rate, e to the minus r over d and this rate. The point is uniform exponential decay no matter which circle packing. When p is less than one half and, and presumably one half, there's no cluster at one half as well by conjecture one. And if you get that, then you almost prove Binyamini's conjecture on transient graphs because uh, you, you get that they, per, they have an infinite cluster at any p greater than a half. So it's, it's, it's useful for that. Um, the last thing in this vein is to study ellipse packings. Uh, so circle packings, ellipse packing doesn't seem to matter much, but if you give uh, an aspect ratio to your shapes, if they're elongated, then, um, the non-quantitative results are not affected. Uh, there shouldn't be an infinite cluster at one half, but the quantitative result, the dependence on the exponential decay could be affected. And the question is to ask, uh, to understand the, the effect of the aspect ratio. We don't even understand it for small p and it has applications to the Lupo and model. So I, I think it's useful. It's, you give me a planar, the, the point is the following. You give me a planar graph, I circle pack it, and I see it doesn't go to infinity and also doesn't go very far, the percolation. But before I circle packed it, it could have gone far because the circle packing distorts the distances. So I don't want to circle pack. I want to look at the original graph and say it doesn't go far. But the original graph, if it's a packing, then maybe it has elongated shapes. The question is what's the dependence on the aspect ratio of these shapes? And this is not understood even for small p and it is useful because I want quantitative bounds on the original graph. So this is about that. And lastly, um, <clears throat> what happens at one half? At one half, so this is like a critical behavior. If you combine the conjectures from the previous slide, then you may uh, guess that PC equals one half sometimes. That is, not only do you not have an infinite cluster at one half, but in fact, PC equal one half for any pig larger than it you have. Uh, and, the, and this will follow from the previous conjectures, for instance, for, for circle packings with bounded diameters, bounded above diameters. Possibly, you may guess that it even holds if the diameters are allowed to grow, but only sublinearly in the distance to the origin. Otherwise, there is a counterexample. In any case, um, there is a, a certain class of circle packings where PC is a half, or should be, should be a half. And then you may ask, how does the, the percolation at one half look like? And a big, a huge conjecture would be that uh, at one half, the scaling limit is like on the triangular lattice. It's the conformal loop ensemble, CLE. Uh, for those who've heard about SLE, this is relative. So uh, it looks like all these, so the 
the conjecture here would be that on, on circle packings, the critical percolation looks like what it does on the triangular lattice. So somehow it doesn't matter if you're here or there. And the weaker statement is to show Russo-Simo Welsh estimates. This means that uh, you take a circle packing, you ask for a connection, a long connection of retained disks in a, sil in a, in a rectangle, and that still has a good chance, depending on the aspect ratio of the rectangle. And, and, the, and, and there was a related conjecture of Binyamini uh, from the same paper of 2018. Binyamini discussed uh, squaring of the square. You take a square and you fill it by squares in such a way that there are no four squares touching at the point. So only three squares are allowed to touch at the point. I've put here a uh, particular way to do it. In fact, doing it is not obvious. If you want to tile a square with squares so that only three touch at the point, it's not completely obvious. Um, to do it for a rectangle is easier and that would also be interesting. In any case, he sp spoke about a square tiled with squares and he wanted to say that at p equal one half, no matter what square tiling you used, the chance to see a left-right crossing of retained squares is is bounded above or below, it doesn't matter. It's bounded from zero one uniformly in the way you've tiled the square. And this is a russo simo welsh type estimate. So if you want to focus on a concrete question very relevant, then this is a concrete question of this sort, that no matter what way you tile it, there is a good chance for left-right crossing. And, uh, and this last conjecture of Benjamin, if you allow me to use p very small or very high, I can, uh, I have uh, the result. That is, it follows from the circle packing. For p not very small or very close to one, you have or don't have a crossing. Okay, this is all. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much for a lovely talk, Ron. Um, if anybody would like to ask a question, could you please let us know in the chat? And just while we're waiting, maybe I'll ask one. Could you say a little bit more, Ron, about um, your kind of original motivation about the ON model? Uh, okay, uh -huh. so I, I somehow I, I didn't think many in the audience would be interested, so all I prepared was the <laughs> was this funny picture and uh, maybe zoom in to actually see it. Uh, let's see, maybe I can bring up, uh, let, let me bring up a bigger picture of this uh, type and uh, that might help us. Um, just a minute. This one, yeah. Okay, I, I'm bringing up the same picture, but it's, uh, but it's in a nicer, uh, in a bigger format. Uh, okay. okay, can you see now the Lupo N picture, Christina? Yes. Okay, so uh, this Lupo N model, if I go in very, very, uh, small resolution, you can see it's, it's actually something built upon the uh, hexagonal lattice. So the, uh, the basic constituents are edges of the hexagonal lattice, and these are random edges that form sets of loops. The way it's uh, sampled is that the chance to see in a finite volume uh, a particular configuration of loops is proportional to n to the number of loops, x to the number of edges, and this picture was sampled with particular values of n and x. And it's conjectured that these are critical, meaning that these loops are like conformal loop ensemble with some parameter that they, they satisfy various things. And, uh, and, and uh, what I needed was to know that the graph of loops, when you percolate the loops themselves, so each loop you retain with some chance and you race with the complementary chance independently, that this graph doesn't percolate to infinity. And, and, and the, I, I couldn't prove that because I don't know much about the structure of the loops, but if I took a Benjamin Schramm limit, so if I took a uniform point and looked around it, then I could using the results. Um, and this was helpful. It showed that in the phase diagram of the model, there is a, uh, a positive area of parameters where there are big loops. I can go into more details of. Great, thank you. So there's sure. a, a question from Oliver Redden. So I'm going to... Uh, yes, I'll go back to the slideshow. Uh -huh. I'm going to un unmute Oliver so he can ask his question. There you go, Oliver. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, firstly, that was very nice. Thank you. Um, thank you, Oliver. I, yes. Can, can you hear me? Yes, Oliver, I hear you. Am I audible? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, yes, yes, I hear good, you. Thanks. Okay, that, that was good, good, good. That was very nice. Um, 
it's not clear it would be useful for anything, but this argument, it feels like there's some sort of inefficiency in the union bound over the other square S. And it sort of very vaguely reminds me of something I can't quite pin down from classical burglation. Maybe it's an ar argument of Menshikov or something, where yes. if, if you work with expectations instead of probability, it might be possible to avoid it. That you, or you, you won't have an expectation on one side and a probability on the other side or something. I, I've forgotten the details that you sort of explore out uh -huh. in the graph right. without the big things. Right, stop. right. And then, uh -huh. um, so uh, potentially to go closer to one half, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't do anything significant. It might just change your e to the minus. So, right, so there's Menshikov and there's Eisenman-Barsky, which indeed are related. Uh, oh, oh, maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Th those I talk about remember. the fact that when p is smaller than pc, then the chance that you connect to distance r is exponentially yeah. decaying in the distance. That, that's the sharpness of the phase transition. There's a very nice screen. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh -huh. and indeed, this last question that I posted uh, here, the conjecture number two, discusses sharpness of this kind. So for any piece smaller mm -hmm. than half, conjecturally, that's PC for some class of these things. Or in any case, it's smaller than PC. You have exponential decay of connection probabilities. So going in this direction would be very interesting. But I'd like to do it with a uh, rate of exponential decay, which is uniform in the circle packing. And to my, I haven't actually explored it, but it might go beyond yeah. the current technology. That yeah, is, it's the Eisenman-Barsky argument, I think, is the one. That uh, well, Menshikov and Eisenman-Barsky, they had independent mm -hmm. proofs. And, uh, but recently, there are nice, very short proofs of uh, Hugo Dominil Copan, von Santasio, and Aran Raufi. Uh -huh. without, uh, I forget who did who. Uh, so, um, so the, and, and this, this is very much in the vein of uh, conjecture number two. Mm -hmm. uh, right, very good. Yeah. Great, that, that seems to be it for the questions. So in a moment, I'm going to stop recording and let everybody applaud. But before I do that, maybe let me say um, that next week's seminars will be from Agilos Yoga Kopolos and from Christina Toninelli. And we hope to see many of you next week. Um, so I think it remains just to thank Ron again for a beautiful seminar and to unmute you all. Hold on a second. Um.